the best part of doing a podcast with you is that I get to talk to you. Mm. I miss you. <laughs> and and I get to see you. I get to see like on work time. Like it's not like I'm trying to call you in the middle of work and I know I'm not going to catch you because you're in the middle of your work. I just have a moment. Yeah, we're we're getting we're we're this is yeah this is considered work. <laughs> hey Simon, it's it's a real job to be your. <laughs> what? Just, what, what does that I'm mean? Joking. I'm just joking. That's like the that's like the it's it's what we're saying implicitly, but also it's such a joy. Well, no, it's because we both get we both love what we do for a living, and it all makes the most sense when you get to say my favorite people to spend time with outside of work and share life are also people. Yeah. Yeah, that's how for me that's how i know i'm on the right track professionally so um i did no preparation for this interview whatsoever Perfect. because whatever um you are famous because of milk bar and i have a couple questions about that that i personally would like to know that weirdly in all these years i've never asked you but uh, you're famous for milk bar you're famous for your netflix tv show you're famous for your books, your cookbooks, and your new book. What's it called? The new book's called Dessert Will Save the World. No. Amen to that. Um, <laughs> like, have you ever seen anybody angry eating ice cream? It just doesn't exist. It does not exist. They're a little less angry. They might still be angry, but the ice right. cream you eat, I mean, it right. a little like, less. I'm so <laughs> mad with this chocolate cake. <laughs> um, uh, and what I thought, you know, you talk about those things a lot, but there's a Christina Tozzi behind all of that magical stuff that I have the deep honor and pleasure mm -hmm. of knowing. And I feel selfish knowing that. And I thought that would be a place for us to go today. Some of the questions I have, we've never talked about before. Okay, anyway, I'm just going to jump right in. So here's the milk bar question I have. <laughs> I've never I can't asked you. wait. <laughs> How did you come up with cereal milk ice cream, which is honestly one of the greatest gifts to humanity? <laughs> I would it's put the discovery. I would put the discovery of penicillin <laughs> and and cereal milk ice cream way up there. That's very sweet. For me, it's like the you know when you do something that's like bigger, bigger than yourself in a way that's like. I don't know. It just kind of happens. And my only job is to be the conduit for it yeah. um, in life. I imagine you must feel like that all the time. These are now I'm going like, oh, wow, there are these questions that I have never act actually asked you either. Um, for me, cereal milk is the representation of making someone, that angry person eating ice cream on a bad day, just making them feel like seen and loved and trust somewhere at some point in their life where they felt like, calm and safe and trusted and seen without any of the other or this is my name or this is who I am or this is what I do. There's like a sacred moment that happens, I suppose, in a bowl of cereal <laughs> at well, some you, point you, in all of our lives, no matter what the cereal is. It, I, there, there's it, the, the magic of that product. It's not just tasty ice cream because mm -hmm. there are many flavors of tasty ice cream that I love, but there is no flavors of tasty ice cream that so tap into nostalgia and childhood i mean if you make dessert of course dessert like make dessert and save the world it makes people happy it does the thing like desserts a sacred space like aside from a tasting menu only restaurant where someone's going to serve it to you like desserts an opting course right like it's also not it's something people it's choose to do course. not something that people have to do right. and i take that choice personally like i take it seriously i take it personally that is a sacred sacred space that people invite you into like we say in the book like dessert has this habit of showing up right like of course cake shows up at birthdays but like if there's a wake or a funeral or sh like dessert is there dessert has this way of showing up for people in these moments and that's that's sacred stuff that's a really I love talk. the fact that, that you think about that dessert is a discretionary course. So you're not actually competing against other no. desserts. You're competing against, let's get out of here and go watch a movie at home. You're competing against, oh, I've put on so much weight. You're competing against like yes. all of those yes. things. You're, but competing you're not competing with people's against emotional other food. neuroses, like their <laughs> so dark good. sides, meet their emotional child, meet their, you know, meet their intellect. Like you were in the middle of it argument largely in someone's head yeah. or some brilliant resolution where someone was just like in the head 
be quiet. We're going. We're going to Milk Bar. We're doing the thing. We're whatever. I don't know how to do this without it being weird, but my real vision for fine dining is that dessert follows you home and is like there for you in bed. That or like they give you pajamas to change into so that when you just like dessert then sleep. By the way, by the way, (laughs) I do this. I do this frequently. I go for a nice meal. I'll have my meal. And I will very often say, I'd like this dessert to go, please. And so you don't have to find a way to deliver it at home. You just have to find an elegant way to put it in a cooler pack so it stays fresh and is beautifully all. presented when you get home. That's all. I do that regularly. Yeah, it's I take not a nice city. Home. It's like, because I want to eat this in home. With I want to eat it, but I want to eat it in about an hour. Covers. Yeah, I, just- I want to eat it in about an hour. Yeah. And I want to eat it in front of the TV. I don't want to eat it at, at a restaurant. Yeah. So I'm going to change subjects on you. We're going to, we're going to this, is, this is a dramatic shift now. This is a dramatic shift of key. We're going to go from a major key to a minor key. Well, um, I regularly on this podcast will talk about vulnerability and I will talk about um, during COVID that I made a rule with all my friends that there's no crying alone. I talk about this idea of no crying alone. What I don't ever say is that during COVID, you and I called each other more than a couple times and cried together. And I remember the first time you called and you were walking, you were walking you were going for a long walk. You'd left the house. Don't remember how it started. And I remember the preamble. You said, I don't remember what you said about how you were doing, but clearly it, you were in a difficult place. It was a difficult time. And you said, I could go to my husband, but he's also in a difficult place. And I don't want to add more to his plate. And so do you have a minute? And I remember, I don't remember the conversation at all, but I remember we cried together. And it was, I always adored you and I've always been a fan of yours, but it was on that day, yeah. like this, this friendship, like it became real. It, it was, it was set in concrete, you know, it went from fun to solid yeah. and I, I, do you remember that day? You know, it's funny you ask because you're saying this in my head. I'm like, Simon, I remember the tree I was standing under. I remember the gate, like the sort of like the way when, when you walk and you kind of almost walk like um, a soldier um, where you sort of like kick your heels up a little bit because I'm, yeah. I was just sort of like grasping for straws. And I remember the phone ringing and I remember hearing your voice. Like I remember where I walked. Yeah. I remember I remember those steps. What is it about why don't people call a friend in need? You know? I mean, here we are. I trust you with everything. I would call you and tell you I'm struggling. I would call you and tell you I'm hurting. I would call you and tell you I'm flailing. I would call and tell you I'm confused. I'm lost. I would call and tell you all of those things. And I want to know why other people don't. I have friends who don't call other people in times of need. And I and they, they have this weird sense of I don't want to burden anyone with my yeah. problems or there's shame or embarrassment attached, especially if somebody considers themselves a high performer. I was going to say there's probably part of it that also is if I say it out loud and I have to hear myself, one, that makes it true. And two, making it true means I have to admit it and then grapple with it and deal with it. And if you're talking about high performers, you're talking about people that implicitly don't want to admit defeat and confusing vulnerability with defeat, right, is probably like no, number one reason why yeah. why people that are high performers struggle. And then also if you're a high performer, the second you say it out loud and you acknowledge that it's a thing, then you have to go out and solve it. And if you don't think you have a solve for it, it's 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 too it's too big to even conceive of stating out loud. Though of course the irony is saying it out loud 
releasing yourself of it to someone that is trustworthy is oftentimes half, if not so much more of the grappling with it and dealing with it and taking one, like taking that first step is, is oftentimes so much of getting, getting through it, getting into it, making way. Uh, it's decompartmentalizing, right? Uh, yeah, sure. Because I've talked to, I have friends in the military and they, they do know how to compartmentalize their emotions, but it, they can't do it forever. Yeah. They can only do it for It'll a very catch short up period with you. Of, they can only do it for a very short period of time while they're in the moments of chaos because they, they don't ha- there, there is no time to deal with whatever they need with the, the emotions in chaos. But they will have to deal with it. Otherwise, that's when all the mental health challenges show up. And what you're talk- what I think is so interesting is you're talking about by, by saying it out loud, because thinking it, you can, it's still ethereal. It's a thought, yeah. right? Yeah. But by saying it out loud to another human being, you're decompartmentalizing and saying, this is a real thing. And you you can't escape it now, right? That's it. You can't hide from it. You put yourself on it. notice. Yeah. You put yourself on notice. And that's a very scary feeling if you don't have the solution ready and lined up for the problem that you're you're putting out there. But that's the whole point of decompartmentalizing. Mm-hmm. Have but you always- also- yeah, sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, no, please, please. I was going to say, but like the for my my experience with you is the most beautiful part of our friendship. Like, why did I call that day? Why were you the person that I called? It's not like I tried six other people. Like, I went on a walk. I knew I was going to call you. I hit I I hit Simon in my phone, and it yeah. went. And for me, the biggest piece of that, the reason I knew that you were my person to call, was because of the conversations we were having beforehand, which is you not only gave me the space for vulnerability, but you gave me language around the fact that like people that, that, that believe part of their work. And that is, that is part of my belief. I believe that so much of my work and what brings me joy and why I work as hard as I do is because I want to show up and help people. And you when we're having like our high times and our high moments, you always have this beautiful way of saying like, man, with like when we're high, we're high, but let's not forget to your point that we can't feel high always, right? Like we're going to feel grounded and part of feeling grounded is, means that we're going to dip below feeling, feeling, yeah. you know, level set. And that happens and it's frequent and when it does let's not run away from it and it it almost made me feel stronger to call you to say oh shit i'm having a moment that's yeah. like this moment that we're talking about it was an invitation into say you feeling this way actually is validating that your work matters and that you're on the right course and that you're human and that you're all of these things it was there's an, an insight here. there's an insight here that is really important right which is most of us, and we're all guilty of this, present company included, right? Most of us offer to support our friends when we see that they are hurting or in pain, which is like calling to buy insurance while the house is on fire, right? And the insight is, is that we ignore the possibility of hard or bad times with ourselves or the people we love. We ignore them in the good times because why would we? It's like when the stock market is rallying, nobody thinks about it crashing, right? And the one thing we did, probably by accident, but the one thing that we did is in the high times and the celebrations and the high fives and the woohoo and we'll like, this is life forever and it's never going to change. We we're prescient enough to say, hey, isn't this amazing? But remember, when this feeling goes away, we have to be there for each other. In other words, we bought the insurance, the insurance early. You knew you had a policy <laughs> when, 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 your, when your feelings crashed. I had my Simon Sinek friend policy already executed, babe. It was filed away. I knew I, knew I had You it. just had to be like, I know it's in here somewhere, right? Exactly. And I think what you're talking about is the responsibility of good friends. And I would even go so far as the responsibility of good friends, the responsibility of good leaders, and the responsibility of good coworkers, yeah. which is in the very high times to start to start writing policies, to start writing insurance policies, saying, look, I hope you never have to use this. I hope your house never burns down. But 
on the horrible occasion that it may, just remember you've got this policy, cash it in. And I think it I think this is huge that in high times we we're not Debbie Downers by reminding people, hey, this isn't gonna last. We're writing insurance policies. Okay. That's such it. a good insight. It's a it's applauding the high times and being like, but to be clear, no matter what the time is. I'm always your friend. Like, yeah. there's no fair weather here. Of course, of course, of course, things are great right now. I, and to be human is going to be that there's going to be a time in life. And and I want to show you what our friendship really means. Yeah. So the question the question I have is: Were you always good at asking for help, or is it a skill you had to learn? I'm t- I'm, I'm in fact terrible at asking for help. In a very interesting way, you are calling out a dynamic of our friendship that is, I would say, very bespoke to our friendship. I'm Ooh. terrible at asking for help. I am not great. I'm great at being vulnerable in certain moments with certain people, and the rest of the time, I plow through it. So I'm not a one-size-fits-all in, in this okay. spirit of asking for help and vulnerability. So why, what, is, what is the reason you don't want to ask for help? But I think probably the tricky part of like where, depending on where you're at in life, the things that made you successful oftentimes are the things that hold you back or you make yeah. to certain tiers of, you know, air quote success. Um, and I think that's part of it, right? To be an entrepreneur, you have to be, to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to be determined. You have yeah. to go at it, like always stay in the game, never quit figure it out that's not so you can't ask for help along the way but you you have to be really determined to you know solving problems and be okay that sometimes help doesn't come and you still have to succeed and then all of a sudden being grown up and being like oh if i want the richness of life and surround sound i have to invite other people in i can't just to your point we can't just show i can't just show up for people i have to invite other people in otherwise i stop losing the connection of like why cereal milk does the thing or you you stop losing the richness of friendship. So how can you give seven friends, six friends a birthday party at your own birthday party if they aren't true friendships? And that's that's a dynamic that I'm that is definitely up on my personal improvement goals list. I I'd like to call bullshit, if I may. <laughs> um because nobody I know entrepreneurs who don't ask for help. Mm. And they can only reach a certain level because they have to be in every meeting. They have to make every decision. Um, and you you can't achieve what you've achieved in the scale that you've achieved it without being forced, <laughs> even if you did it kicking and screaming. Yeah. But you had to delegate and you had to let go and you had to ask people to do things and own things and run things and take accountability for things because you physically could not. Nobody can achieve scale without without... Yeah maybe not asking for help but getting it that for, perhaps it's for me i'm being very literal about the i need help will you help me <laughs> delivery ah, okay. versus versus getting help and part of the getting help for me is the you you have to be fearless as you're building and then you have to be fearless from a failure standpoint i suppose both in building and when to your point when you're scaling and you invite other people in to the party truly into the inner circle you have to really trust and be fearless about the fact that people are going to fail you're going to fail people are going to let you down you might let people down whether you're trying to or not and just having like an emotional vigor about you that says no matter what happens i'm gonna be okay are your team is your team good at asking for help sometimes Probably not, not it, there. I, oh Lord, this is really a deep dive. Probably not. It, they are probably, I would say that they're very similar to me. And I don't know I've ever had someone say, I need help. Yeah. But rather an invitation in that sort of implies, I'd love your brain share. I'd love your feedback. Right. I need your support, but not the, there's a little bit of this, like the, the fear of like being like, I need help. And what it implies, because that's actually, you're so great at that. You're so great at the the balance of, I'm curious, and I'd love for you to unlock more than what I do or don't know without overtly being like, the like, 
the what do you mean? Help me feels say, say, say like that. I'm drowning. The help me for oh. me feels like I don't know how to swim. I'm drowning. I'm in over my head as opposed to the curiosity of inviting other people to the table and saying, tell me more. Like, what don't I know? Tell me more. Do, do, do you what know one of the things that I've learned is that there's two ways of asking for help, right? Most people think asking for help is, as, and you said this before, is the admission of defeat. Yes, none. And so their temperament is defeated, right? Um, I don't know what I'm doing. And uh, can you help me? I, I need help. I need help. I'm drowning. I need help, right? And And I've always thought of it as a mindset which is to ask for help with confidence, right? Like, hey, can somebody please like help me out here? I am completely underwater and I definitely need some help. Otherwise, I don't know, I'm going to drown or something. Like somebody please just help me, right? And to have a sense of humor or a confidence in the asking for help is a mindset. So yeah. you're, you're asking for the same thing with the same, same circumstances in both ways. In one of the cases, you're ashamed of it because as, yeah. you, as, as, as you said, that you equate it to defeat, where I've learned to disassociate asking for help with defeat and simply associate asking for help with, I just need help. Eh, I just need some help. <laughs> but that's a powerful thing. And I like think that, that... You know how to call it out. I, th I think, but what I think this conversation is doing is I want pe anyone who's listening to this to to recognize that asking for help is normal. Yeah. And not only is it normal, it's really nice. I mean, and I'll go back to this, which is I've you've you and I have always got along. We've always had fun. We've always been friends. We've been friends for many, many years. But that one day under that one tree, I remember where I was standing. You remember the tree. I was standing next to my kitchen counter when the phone rang. Like I remember exactly where I was. And we remember specifics of where we were, like when the moon landed, yeah. when the, for the, we remember where we were when we watched, you know, Neil Armstrong walk on the moon, because these things have such impact in our lives. And so how powerful is it that something as innocuous as a friend calling and saying, do you have a minute? that you and I have internalized it like people internalize watching Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. And on that day, we became very close friends. And we don't talk a lot. Let's, 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 like, let's, let's be crystal clear. Like, I don't see you a lot. I don't talk to you a lot. But you and I have the undying confidence that on any moment of any day, if the phone rang and one of us said, got a minute? So I'll just tell you a quick funny story. You'll appreciate this, right? So a friend of mine went through a really tough time and I didn't know about it. And she's a very close friend. Oh. Went through a really, really hard time. And I, I saw her and I was like, hey, what have you been up to? And she's like, I've been really depressed. I've been really having, I'm like, WTF? Like, what? I'm one of those friends you call. Like, I call you, like, you've told me things before. Like, why did you leave me out? Like, Like, why didn't you call me? And she said, I did. I'm like, no, you didn't. She's like, yes, I texted you multiple times. I'm like, what? And I go back and look at my text of like, have I been a horrible friend? And the texts say, what up? What are you doing? Want to come over? And I was like, you mean these? She goes, yeah. I'm like, you mean, you mean the ones that sound like every other text you send me? Like, how the hell am I supposed to know that you're struggling when you send me, what are you doing? You know, and she came upon some research that said that when someone is struggling or in need, all they need is eight minutes from a friend to hold space with them to make them feel better. That's all they need is eight minutes. And so now we have a code word, which is what up, how you doing? But when one of us is struggling, the text is, do you have eight minutes? And that simply means I need you. I'm going to cry. No, it's perfect. And it's eight perfect. minutes, eight minutes. When somebody texts you, eight, do you have eight minutes? Any of us can stop the movie, can walk out of a meeting, can walk out of a room and talk to a friend in need for eight minutes. We spend eight minutes in, a, in the bathroom, for heaven's sakes. 
and we can be there for somebody for eight minutes. We won't, we won't, it's not, we're not there. It's not, we don't need to fix anything. We need to acknowledge that they need help and that they just need to know that they're not alone. And by the way, to be crystal clear, there is no greater honor that you could give a friend than to send them a text message that says, do you have eight minutes? Like, when you're in your own, like, darkness, yeah, I get that you can't see clearly, but there is no greater compliment and gift to let someone know how much they mean to you to, yeah. in, to send that text. There yeah. is, for me, as, as a friend, there is, no, there is no greater. Like, There's no greater honor. I am... And- that is the level friend that I aspire to be. And I don't have a zillion friends because I'm like the friends I have. I'm I'm the on the eight minute, I'm the eight minute text in the middle of the night friends. Like yeah. that is the friends. Yeah. I'm the stop, drop, and roll friends. And to your point, the like, I don't even t- I don't even remember what we talked about. I just remember that making that yeah. call and that walk. It wasn't a two hour walk. No. To your no. point, it's the it so much can happen in eight minutes. It was probably twenty or thirty minutes if I had to guess. Yeah. Maybe an hour at the absolute most. Eight minutes. Eight minutes. And and you and you really you really said it best, which is for anybody who says, I don't want to bother anyone with my problems, like how dare you deny them the awesome honor of getting to hold space with you and sit in mud with you and give eight minutes of their life just to let you know you're not alone. That's the, that the, not to fix things, just to let you know that you're not alone in whatever you're doing. And sometimes it's not deep emotional stuff. Sometimes like, I don't know how to solve this problem and it's silly stuff. But the thought that we don't want to bother our friends is, is, is unbelievably selfish. Bother me. I want to be bothered by the people I love. That is what reinforces my love for them. Yeah. And anybody who doesn't have eight minutes in the course of a day, they may not have eight minutes in a second. (laughs) You know, you might be on a plane. I get that, you know? (laughs) But when you get off the plane, you got to walk to the taxi. That's about eight minutes. Be the eight-minute friend. And if if someone in your life is not an eight-minute friend, I think so. Then they're just then they're just fun. They're just acquaintances. Totally. They just move them to a different place. And you're like, yeah, they're not, they don't have to be ejected from your life, but you just wouldn't call them in a time of need. And that's okay. Yeah. I have friends I that like I wouldn't that. call in time of need, but I love them and I think they're great fun. Yeah. But they're not, they're not, they're not, they're just not on that speed dial. That's true. Well, can you tell me something you've done in your career? And it doesn't matter if it's commercially successful or not. I don't care. But can you tell me a specific thing that you've worked on in your career? that you absolutely loved being a part of and that if every project or everything you ever worked on was like this one thing you'd be the happiest person alive yes i can tell you because it's like fresh in my in my in my brain in my life eight club it's this crazy quirky little thing that i started during the pandemic it used to be daily now it's weekly club that anyone can join it happens on instagram live at 2 p.m eastern standard time every friday and i literally just wherever i am we bake something together and i won't tell you what we're baking i'll just tell you what the basic ingredients are that you need and it's usually no more than i don't know three five maybe seven um and you just show up with a cannonball spirit of whatever it is i got my ingredients ready set go and we spend Five minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes baking. We make a pl- I make a playlist every week. You, you listen, you dance, you watch, you bake, you make mistakes, you mess up, you burn stuff, I drop stuff, whatever it is. But it's like it's a carved out time together to be intentional and free in a very lose yourself, find yourself spirit. And it's a club in a way that it's this collection of people that Simon are like, they're all over the U.S. at this point, and they show up for each other. Someone texted someone, someone at, at Bay Club messaged me the other day and was like, hey, this person's mom died, and she had been battling for a while, and she is having a really hard time, and she, I want to show up for her. Her favorite thing is this one thing that you made this one time. Can you send the care, can you send the care package to her, et cetera, et cetera. But it has become this network of incredible humans. 
some of whom, to be clear, don't even date. They just show up for the vibes and the spirit of community. Some of them have never even met each other. They're just pen pals. And it is, it's the power of dessert, but it's really like, it's a wide open door for anyone and everyone to like, to, to be the closest thing to it, to that eight minute friend. Um, and it's completely human. It's not choreographed. It's not rehearsed. It is me on whatever my, whatever I am at 2 p.m. on a Friday. It's a good day. It's a bad day. It's a rainy day. And I'm showing up and I'm, I am an introvert. I don't, I do not get energy from being out and about and, and, and. And it forces me every Friday to really ask myself on a good day and a bad day, like, what are you, what are you here for? What are you showing up for? Um, and it's an invitation. It's a, it's a door open in to anyone that wants to come into my home and just needs some company or needs to laugh at me or needs to laugh with me or wants to bake or needs an excuse or needs like a babysitter. Some people put their kids in front of bake club <laughs> and it is the most. I love it because to your point, there's no transaction of commerce and it has, uh, it's a club, which is something that I very much found my identity. And when I was a teenager, of oh, there's clicks and this and that and the other, and I have all my friends, but like you get to sort of choose what you're interested in or to find your people in it. And I love that it's this community of people that I have everything to do with and nothing to do with. And there's just like an immense pride of its stickiness and the space that it holds in people's lives. Mm. Anyways. Tell me an early specific happy childhood memory. Something I can relive with you. Uh, um, uh, God, this is such a good question. My, like my favorite earliest food memory is um, my mom... Uh, comes to pick me and my mom, working mom, comes to pick me and my sister up from, it must have been like preschool and kindergarten, first grade. Um, I was a, I still am a very messy kid. And so she'd always dress us in dresses, but they would like send us out for recess and I would just sit in the, in the dirt and then and she was just like, I can't believe that you, you know, ruined another, yeah, another outfit. <laughs> and then like seatbelts buckles us into the back of the car, blue Ford Taurus. I always sit behind the driver's seat. That that was always my seat. Um, it was one of those um one of those sedans where you change changed the gears with a little stick shift up here. Um yeah, and I yeah. remember her like mom purse that had the multiple pockets and it was always like old tissues hanging out and then and then and then and she put it in the middle because the, the front seat was also like a bank head bench. Yeah. The little armrest yeah. down she where she would normally sit her purse was empty and her purse was on the dashboard instead which was very strange and she pulls halfway out of this like preschool kindergarten parking lot and pulls over and when they pulled over my mom or my dad it was because we were fighting my older sister and i were fighting kicking each other once i opened the door because i was like, curious don't, what don't would make happen. me pull this car over kind of thing yeah. right and my heart goes into shock, like, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit. What do we do? What do we do? And she digs into her purse. I'm like, oh, <laughs> what could this be? And she pulls out a bag of sugar babies that she left in her purse on the dashboard to be warmed by the sun. And out of nowhere, this makes no sense whatsoever, tears open the bag of sugar babies. And, you know, they're little brown sugar pieces. They're probably just food for your taste, Simon, but they're very magical. <laughs> and she, like, doses out two to my sister. And I remember the clink of these two little pieces of, like, sugar-coated candy clinking into my sister's hand and then into mine. And she pours a few into hers. And just quietly, there's no words exchanged because we're so perplexed. And I don't know, she must have been having good day or a bad day i don't know i've asked her she doesn't remember the day at all which is hilarious to me because it's so vivid in my memory and we just eat these warm brown sugary sugar babies that have been very intentionally warmed by the sun and i don't remember anything else about what happened that day what happened afterwards i remember it was done in complete silence and it was the equivalent of when you watch someone as an adult eat something really good and they just go and you can see there's sort of like eyelids flicker and take them somewhere. Right. 
my food memory. That's like my first, that's my first vivid memory as a kid that was joyful and it's, it's, it had to do with sugar and dessert. So do you, what I find is, aston- thank you for sharing that, by the way. What I find astonishing about you, and we've never talked about this, is that story, Bait Club, and almost everything we've ever talked about today is the exact same story. How so? Which you've used the word invitation so many times today. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if you've even realized it. You keep saying invitation, invitation. And who you are is like you surprise people with sugar, and I don't mean literally. You surprise people with sweetness. And that you happen to be a dessert person is just, it's just poetic. But, <laughs> but the way you describe Bait Club is it started off in COVID to be this little surprise. You show up no matter what. Nobody, and it's, if you use the, what happened when that car as a kid, it's the same experience for people. They don't know what they're going to get. They don't know what kind of mood you're in, but all you know is you show up for other people. Your mother showed up for the kids. No matter, you don't know what mood she's in. People don't know what mood you're in, but you're going to give them a little something that just brightens their day. And that's who you are. You. <laughs> Oh, stop. You're going to make me. <laughs> you, 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 sh- you're, you are an introvert. You're also close to the vest. You're hard to read. You know, there are times I've hung out with you. I don't know if you're in a good mood or a bad mood. And then all of a sudden, biscuits come out. And this, you are, you have become your mother. We're, we're kind of in the back seat going about our day and then all of a sudden something happens we don't know what's going on and the result is something delightful and sweet and, and that's what it is to be your friend um, and that's what it is to be in bait club and that's what it is to work at milk bar you know it's kind of like we're going through our routines and then you interrupt our routines with a little bit of magic and that's that's you, your purpose on this planet is to perpetuate what your mother instilled in you that day, to do the extra, to do the extra, to go the extra length. It's that's what it is. It's not that she just gave you the candy. She went to the extra length of, of preparing the candy and warming it in the sun. You 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 said she 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 they were heated intentionally, and that's what you do. It's with great intention that you make preparations to surprise people with a little bit of sweetness in their lives, just a little bit to keep them going that day. Yeah. That's what you do. You make you put in a lot of effort. What what the you know it warming the candy on the dashboard uh, has become an entire business and enterprise for you. A lot of effort, a lot of thought for a little bit of magic and a little bit of sweetness for the rest of us. Because you're always thinking about us and your customers and your friends. Get. Well, so seen. I feel so seen and also therapized in a way that. <laughs> you know, I talk about cause a lot and sacrifice. And um, people always ask me, like, how do you, like, I, I believe in quitting. Like, you, you know, I don't believe in like stubbornness. To the to a to a self destructive level, but the question is, how do you know when to quit, right? And for me, the sacrifice has to feel worth it. Mm-hmm. Like I'm giving a lot, not sleeping a lot, working a lot, but the impact that I'm having, and if you ask me to do the equation, it feels worth it. And if it no longer feels worth it, you know, you have struck that balance where tremendous amounts of effort, but it's all worth it. You're one of the hardest working people I know on the planet. You don't rest, but the amazing thing is to you, whether it's having guests over to your house or whether it's bait club or whether it's the milk bar enterprise, it's worth it because you get two little kids in the back seat 
to smile and have a little bit of joy and carry a memory for the rest of their lives. And we carry the memory of talking in the woods and we carry the memory of our childhood when we eat cereal and milk ice cream. It's all the same story. Insane. It's so true. How many memories do you have? Not that many, right? The thoughtful. We only remember the things that matter. Tozy, I love you. I love you. If you enjoyed this podcast and would like to hear more, please subscribe wherever you like to listen to podcasts. And if you'd like even more optimism, check out my website, simonsinek.com, for classes, videos, and more. Until then, take care of yourself, take care of each other.